Hello, everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Atkin. I'm your host, Olivia Atkin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We give you real life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Christina Stokes. Christina is the Senior Vice President and Director of Talent Acquisition at the Rubenstein Company. She manages and executes all aspects of the talent acquisition process and recruiting lifecycle from researching, identifying, and interviewing to hiring and onboarding talent at all seniority levels across all areas. You can find Christina on LinkedIn by searching Christina Stokes or by emailing her at cstokes at rubenstein.com. Hello, Christina. It's fantastic having you on the show today. Hey, Olivia. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course, let's dive right into it. To start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like to Christina Stokes? I actually hear this question a lot when I'm doing college tours to Rubenstein. Uh, A lot of early career professionals tend to want to lean into, how do I know if I'm making it or if I've made it? So I think about this pretty often. And for me, I think success is really, you're doing something that you're passionate about and performing at the highest level that you can while still learning. I'm not sure that that would be the same for everyone. I'm in fact, pretty sure it wouldn't be. But I think if you like what you do and you're doing well at what you do, you're using those skills, but still growing, that's success right there. Um, not being stagnant and kind of reaching and not stopping. That That's always how I've looked at it, at least. And I love how you mentioned the fact that you're continuously growing and not stagnant in a role. And sometimes, you know, tasks, don't necessarily change every single day or every single month. So we can get that feeling of stagnant but mm-hmm. in a certain role. But as long as you as an individual are trying to look at things from a different perspective or how can I grow or improve the tasks that I'm doing, it helps you to not become stagnant within that role as well. How do you try to challenge yourself to continuously grow and not become stagnant in your role. For sure. Well, I mean, even just taking the past couple of years into account during the pandemic, many companies across any industry, they were really slowing down on hiring. Lots of places were laying people off in huge numbers. Places were going out of business. Thankfully, Rubenstein, solid business plan. We stayed afloat, stayed healthy, continued to do amazing things for clients and for our staff internally. But during that time, it did slow down in terms of hiring. So if that is my primary MO, what am I supposed to do at that point? So um, LinkedIn Learning was giving all these free workshops and classes. I took so many, um, got a bunch of certifications, signed up for different kinds of trainings, um, got a certificate from the University of South Florida in DEI, started signing up for different classes. I participated even more so, even though it was it was virtual at the time, with different associations that are relevant to the industry that I recruit in. And I just stayed active and got more involved. I had conversations on different people's shows and did a lot of writing. So even if I wasn't constantly recruiting and onboarding people like I would during a typical year, um, I was still busy and I was still trying to continue to hone my craft, essentially. For sure. And I think the other part of that as well is the aspect that you were thinking outside the box, uh, what skills you might also need down the road and utilize that time to kind of gain that insight. Also gauge potentially how for you looking at talent as well, what might be different criteria that people are going to be looking for? What might be when you talk about um, diversity inclusion, that way to tie people in that is outside the box too, because work environments are changing. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to recruit different types of individuals because before where you look at an organization that wanted everyone in house, right. And in a location now COVID really showed us that people can work from home and be productive. So 
you have the ability as well to really go, oh, wait, I can hire that person that's out of state to perform that job. That's right. And we went from being a fully, you know, Monday through Friday on site uh, organization headquartered in New York City with a small south satellite in Los Angeles to everyone being fully virtual. <laughs> everyone had desktop computers. We all have laptops now. And now we work in a hybrid model like many industries do. Um, and it's been really successful for us. And everyone kind of likes that flow of being able to ease into the week on a Monday, ease out on a Friday and kind of have less uh, commuting time. So I, I, you're right. It did kind of allow us to diversify the talent pool and look for people in ways that we didn't before and really value different skill sets, perhaps, that we didn't look at that way before just being thrown into this new environment, which isn't new anymore. Um, and, and just having tools available like Zoom and, and everything else has made that so much easier. And I think we're all really successful and better for it. In the, and not even just as a recruiter, or as a talent acquisition person working in the PR space. I think all of us have really benefited from that in our personal relationships, too. For you, as now you are looking at candidates potentially a little differently, what are some of the things that you now hone in on that you didn't? And how has that changed throughout your career as well um, and how you look at perspective uh, hires? Yeah. Well, I <laughs> when I started recruiting um, over 15 years ago now, I, I we were posting jobs on Craigslist. <laughs> you know, and That was really Craigslist and monster jobs. Those are really the places where you looked and where you went. And it was a completely different environment. Most people are using LinkedIn or they're using pr the websites of professional associations relevant to what they do to look at those job boards. So targeting people is much easier because you can access the right talent in an easier way, but also people are overstimulated. They don't want to be online all the time. So you have to find a way to connect with folks and keep them in your network. So you're kind of always pipelining and mining that talent, even if you're not hiring for something that they might be good for down the line. You want to just always be networking, always talking to people. You can't wait until you have an open job. And that's definitely something different than how it used to be when, you know, I worked in an office where all of the candidate files were resumes and folders and drawers <laughs> on paper. And that is definitely not the world we live in anymore. And you hit on something there that can also be reversed that I want to touch upon. Always be networking and always be looking for the role. And it isn't about necessarily the role you're trying to fill as an employer today or as an, someone coming into an organization, the role they want to fill today. But it's building and fostering the relationship so that down the road, it's I have the perfect candidate for this. I know this and that. What would you say to someone who's looking at networking as it's going to give me the here and now? A quick result and not thinking long term. I, I mean, there is no quick result in networking. I think that's the beauty of it, though. And that's why I tell early career professionals, you know, when you go visit an employer, connect with all those people on LinkedIn, figure out what groups they're a part of and join them, you know, send your thank you notes afterwards, send email follow ups, keep in touch. If you don't do that, you're missing out on that opportunity. And you can start fostering those relationships from the very beginning of your career while you're still in school even. But you have to do that throughout your career as well. So I still keep in contact with any of my mentors and bosses and colleagues from much earlier in my career, you know, and, and I have great relationships with them, even outside of the professional arena. And if ever I need a quote for an article, I know immediately who I want to talk to. And these are people I've hired, people I've worked for, going, you know, over 15 years of just incredible talent in different industries. And you have to work to keep that alive. And I think the people that are really good at doing that and they do it in an authentic way, they probably will have an easier time finding a job when the time comes to either wanting to make a change or you know, God forbid you get laid off or something like that. You already know where to go. You have those relationships and people will vouch for you because they know you at this point. And you've worked to make sure that they remember you and think of you when an opportunity presents itself. 
So I, I always ask people to check in with me constantly. <laughs> and I think that's key too, as well, is understanding how the power of networking can affect not just now, but down the road and mm. fostering those relationships because it really is something where you can sit back and I get bombarded all the time of people who want a job and, hey, I saw you worked for the New York Giants. I want to work in professional sports. Will you send my resume along or like call this person? And I'm like, I don't even know you. Now I'm putting my reputation on the line, right? Like some people forget about that aspect is like when you basically cold call someone, right? Pass your resume along. There's an aspect there of they are putting their reputation on the line. And if things go south, they're also burning those bridges potentially. So fostering the relationships, not only are they willing to go to bat for you a whole lot faster, but they're also willing to put their own reputation. They have built years right. building on the line, which says a lot as well. For you, another thing you had brought up was the fact that you've stayed in contact with mentors and people you've worked in a lot of jobs with. For some individuals, they can find that difficult and hard to do, especially if they're the ones trying to reach out to someone in a past job they worked with, then they're just not responding or they don't necessarily know how to go about that because there might be that uncomfortableness, especially in the beginning. How have you tried to make it easy to stay in contact with people, even if you've transitioned industries or roles or switched organizations over the years? You know, I reach out around the holidays. If it's something that I know they celebrate, I'll reach out and make a point to do that. I keep their birthdays on my calendar. So I reach out around that time. If I had relationships with their families or children or just know about them, I'll ask how their kids are doing and I'll send a picture of mine. I just, I don't think that when someone leaves a job necessarily where you work together closely, that that should be the end of your relationship. And I think that's really, that's really sad. You spend so much time working that a relationship doesn't need to be over just because you don't work in the same office space anymore or something like that. So, um, you know, I'll reach out to a former boss who left Rubenstein um, a couple of years ago. And we stay in contact all the time. And we're always putting each other in contact with other people that we know that we think would be valuable for that person to know. So it's kind of like in the public relations space, you know, you never want to pitch a reporter that doesn't cover that topic or beat. It's sort of like that with your networking. You know, don't waste someone's time. Don't necessarily forward along a resume of someone that may or may not be relevant to them because you're doing someone a favor, just be aware of what they do and be mindful of their time. Everyone's out of time. <laughs> no one has the time for anything. And, and it's just, it becomes second nature to check in with those people the same way you would when you're sending like a holiday card to a family member or something like that. Just add those people to that list, set calendar reminders, even if they're important to you, or you think that that relationship is going to be helpful in the future, find ways to remind yourself, like event triggers to just reach out. And I love that because it is so true that it can be the small things, but we all do get busy. And I think you just mentioned some amazing ways that even when we're in the thick of our own lives and we're growing and aiming for new goals to be mindful of what's going on in someone else's life and set up reminders in the best way that we work for ourselves mm -hmm. to make sure that, hey, I've taken the moment to do this. It's on my calendar. I remembered to do it. And so three months goes by and you're like, oh, wait, I meant to do this three months ago. Um, and so that that's some great advice. I want to go in to talking about your journey in HR. You brought up a little while ago that you've now spent 15 years in this industry. How do you, you started this as well, looking at it from not being in college going, I want to go directly into HR. You mm -hmm. took kind of a roundabout path, but it is a path that I continuously have brought up, whether it's on the podcast or on other podcasts that I've done, that you can take skill sets that you learn and then go, oh, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm really good at. And then move into a different industry. For you, how did you get into HR and how have 
you stayed in it for 15 years being as passionate and growing as you continuously do? You know, I anytime I talk to a, a talent acquisition person or a recruiter specifically, um, most of us didn't grow up saying, God, this is definitely what I want to do. <laughs> they always end up in it by either specializing in the field they end up recruiting for or something else happens, or maybe they study HR and go down that path. But that that is not how it happened for me. Um, I worked for a casting director who also ran a film school. So I helped with the casting of talent for commercials and that sort of thing. I helped with recruiting um, people into the film school, like up and coming talent, people who wanted to learn how to act or perform or whatever else. And I would recruit those people to come to forums that we would hold where um, members of industry, agents, producers, that sort of thing would come to those events. And then you'd have to recruit those um, industry representatives to come to the events also. So I was, it's like sales mentality, I suppose, in a way. And I found I was very good at it. And I let, I studied performing arts. So that came naturally to me. So I, I think that a lot of people who work in the field that I work in tend to have similar personality types. You throw us all in a room and we're just like very type A, um, which is fine. Not everyone is like that. But that's how I started. I was working for a casting director, recruiting for film school. I wasn't an, an employer hiring people to come do a job at a company. It was very different, but I found that I was good at it. So when I was looking on Craigslist to make a transition, because that's when it was, um, I found a, a, a recruiting firm headquartered in New York City that just did staffing for administrative type roles, and they needed a junior level person. And I rose my hand, and that was my first real talent acquisition role. But transitioning into more of the HR space where you work um, not just to fill open positions at a variety of company as like an external vendor, I found that I really wanted to have more of a relationship, not with the companies necessarily that I was hiring, hiring for, but I wanted to continue to work with the people that I was placing there. So I found that working in, in this capacity within the organization and hiring for that place and being able to tell that employer's story and watch the people that I was hiring come in and grow and do great things in their career and see that in a first person way and be part of that for the duration, not just when they're going in and going out. That was really fulfilling for me. And that's how that was my success moment. I was like, wow, this is what I want to be doing. So that's how I started working with human resources teams, being that internal hiring person instead of just the vendor or consultant working on the outside. And I think that's important to identify as well a few different things you had mentioned. The aspect of, look, you were working in that studio acting space, but doing a lot of the things that overall skill sets you need within HR, within recruiting, talent acquisition, mm -hmm. it's a lot of the same tasks. It's just filling a different space. You're mm -hmm. in a different space looking for different things. The process is similar. The skill sets that you need to perform that role are similar. The candidates just look different. Right. The conversations are just a little different. And I think that's important to really identify and highlight is that you can jump from HR talent acquisition to acting to food, the skill sets are the same. Mm -hmm. And it can just bring you down a different journey and pivot and vice versa, right? You can go from acting to the HR space and then or, and go from that HR space and go, okay, I want to start in the front end recruiting as a recruiter for different companies, but have the realization that you had too. That's not where the joy comes from. That's right. not where I thought this was going to be like. And sometimes it's a learning path too. You think a job is what you want it to be and it's going to fulfill you in the ways you thought it was going to. But the second you start doing it or over time as you grow in the role, you go, these are the boxes that I do like about the job and these are the boxes I don't. And okay, instead of working on the front end, can I work for the organization so I can see that whole process? And right. you really do that whole process now. So for you, 15 years in doing these different roles, how do you continuously try to find the best candidates for roles? And how has that changed due to the way technology is now and 
just the whole process pivoting over time? Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with where I I spread myself out. So um, I don't have any other recruiters working with me. So I have to wear all the different hats and be able to shift. So anything administrative I'm handling, um, finding the talent I'm handling, I'm reading the resumes, I'm putting up the job ads, I'm figuring out where we should post, I'm going to the events. I'm a, So I'm doing all of that. And I really like having my fingers in all of those different things. I think it's really interesting. And over time, you realize how you have to change the way you look for that talent, like you asked. So I can't just post a position on our company website and expect the talent to come through the door. I can't just put up a job on LinkedIn and throw some ad dollars behind that and still expect to get the right kind of talent. I need to go through the people that I have the relationships with, do that networking. I need to look at professional organizations where those people are, where are they? Where's the talent? Where are the PR people in New York that work in this industry? Where do they go? Are they affiliated with Colorcom? Are they part of the PRSA? Are they going to the Center for Communication Events? Is there a university that can put me in touch with this talent? Um, Do I want to go to city government to find their press people? Are they in media? So part of what I really love to do is find those dotted lines between what people do and what their skill set is, where they work, because it's not all, you're not always going to find that perfect person in the same box. And then you're really limiting the capability of your company overall. If the entire face of the organization is the same, because you're only looking in one spot. So you just have to be creative and thoughtful. And it really is a candidate driven market right now. So the employers are all vying for the same talent of people and it's challenging, but that, that keeps it interesting, keeps me on my toes. And I can't just rely on the exact same thing that I did in 2019 before the lockdowns. And I can't rely on what I did a year before that. It changes all the time. You have to be on top of the technology and how people are looking for jobs, what they're looking at. Everyone reads reviews now. You have to pay attention to Glassdoor. Everyone's talking to each other. The work environment is just so different than it was even a couple of years ago. It's going to continue to change that way. Mm -hmm. So I have to stand up. And for you, you also deal with the onboarding side because you work for the organization and within your role. So you get to see the unique process of how someone's experiences through onboarding, how they then perform and be able to pivot things along the way. So for you, what are things you try to implement and make sure that it's user-friendly, or shall I say, most rewarding for an individual who does get hired by you while they go through the onboarding process? And what are some of the ways you try to make that onboarding process the most effective both for you and for the candidate you just hired? When it comes to the onboarding, that's where the rest of the HR team at Rubenstein really starts to get involved too. So there's another woman on my team, one of the um, vice presidents that handles a lot of just the benefits related stuff and the payroll. And they coach that person through that piece of it. So they're secure with what they're getting. Then there's the other person who schedules a lot of the trainings that they need on different platforms that they're going to be using in their role regularly. Um, And so part of that is checking in with the candidate. So when they Day one, I'm saying hello. I'm inviting them to Slack channels. I'm making sure they're getting that socialization factor and they're going to everything that the team has scheduled for them Um, and checking in with them, making sure their photos getting uploaded to the website, introducing them. Um, A lot of it is visibility. You know, someone wants to feel welcome, making sure their welcome memo is written and goes out to the staff so everyone's excited and welcoming them. Um, And then after that, you know, it's checking in with them at one week checking in with them at 30 days. Then my team comes in, we do 90 days, we do 60, 90 days, then at four months, which is the end of someone's onboarding, right? At four months, you should know the job. At that point, you should be comfortable in your role. You should know what you're doing. We do a deep dive 360 at that point with their managers and with that new hire, not so new anymore at that point, to make sure we haven't missed anything. you know. And we ask them for feedback. How was your onboarding experience? What didn't we do that you needed? What could have been better? We asked the managers the same thing. How could we have better prepared this person to be successful right away in the role? What do they need going forward? Without those conversations, it's it's flat. You, you don't know what's successful and what isn't when you're bringing someone up to speed in a role. 
And I think that's so important. And I love that you do that as well, because a lot of people can feel whether it's quickly after being hired or a year, two years into the role, maybe sometimes longer, that they got lost in the shuffle, but also the fear of actually using their voice and go, this is what I'm missing. But good leaders go, hey, what do you need from me so that you can perform better? Where are the hiccups happening? Mm -hmm. Is there something that wasn't explained the way you needed it to be explained? Because Sometimes it can be as simple as that of, I just didn't know this wasn't actually provided to you or the way you needed me to tell you those steps. I told you I I wasn't transparent with you. I just gave you the end result and you didn't know how to get from A to B. So I really applaud you for going, okay, we're going to do that for a month's check-in and really ask you, what did you need us to do better too? Because then not just opening that line of communication, but also going, hey, we're all growing. We can all be doing things different. It's not just me giving feedback to you and it being one directional. It's both times really opens the door for communication, but growth on everyone's part. Right. And there's just a great responsibility on my shoulders to bring somebody into an organization. Transitioning into a new job is a huge decision for you, for your family to take someone out of a job where they're successful and happy to make them come work for us. That's a big decision. And you don't want to shift someone's life in that way just to have it fail because you didn't ask the right questions because you weren't open to feedback and change. And we're a a business that's been around for 70 years and I'm proud to work here. So I want people to come. I don't want it to just be the same for everyone for the next 10, 20, 70 years. I I would like the experiences to evolve and for everyone to to get what they need as quickly as they can so they can be successful, so they can grow, so they have a genuine path within the the organization and they don't have to revolve out and go somewhere else. I want them to stay, but I want them to be happy that they're here. So I'm going to flip the question a little bit on you and looking at it from a perspective of the person looking for a role looking for that good fit that you had mentioned. And as you said, it can be, it is a very big decision to go, okay, I'm in this role. I'm going to give this role up to go to this unknown. You Mm -hmm. really don't know until you're in a job, what the job is really like. I think we've all been there. We've signed up for a job and then been like, wait, this isn't what I was told it was going to be. And so it's acknowledging that, but that unknown, what do you think people could be doing to try to make sure they're finding the jobs that they really want? They're having the conversation during the hiring process while that's in an interview or down the road that make sure they're also the best candidate for a job and finding the right jobs that they want to be doing. I think research is so important here for the job seeker. You don't just look at a business's website, look at all the feedback you can find, look up the people you're going to be interviewing with. If you secure that interview, who am I talking to? You know, who, who am I going to be sitting down in that room with or getting on a zoom with what's their background and how can I interject into that conversation? I, people get so scared to go into an interview and that's completely normal, but the reality is the employer is being interviewed also It's not just a one-way relationship. So if you're in an interview conversation and your gut is telling you it doesn't feel comfortable, it's not right, that probably isn't the job for you and you should pay attention to that. You're going to work with different people. Some are more difficult than others. The flow will be more natural with some people than it will with others, but you'll most likely have a conversation with more than one person during the interview process. Ask different questions. Get to the bottom of what the job really is, what the team is like, what the expectations are, what kind of management style someone has. That's going to be so important for you to know. People need to be managed differently. They need different kinds of training and feedback. Some people work very well autonomously and others need more regular check-ins. And that doesn't make you a better or worse performer. That's how you work best. 
And you need to have a team that kind of supports that. So you have to look for that in the interview process so that when you step foot into your new job on day one, it's not such a big shock and surprise. As most people go on in their career, they tend to make better choices when they accept jobs because you you learn that sort of thing as you go. But have, being aware of it earlier on, ask plenty of questions too. You are not the only person being interviewed. Be comfortable asking those questions. Don't just ask about what the culture is like in a company. Get into the nitty gritty and follow up, give feedback. It's just having the conversation. And I love how you said that because a lot of people do forget, especially while they're going through the process, that they also are interviewing someone. You don't have to take a job because the job is in front of you. Right. And a lot of people, especially young professionals, think you have to take that first job. You know, especially if we looked back months ago or a year ago, you're looking at a lot of mass layoffs happening. They continue to happen as time has gone on. They will probably continue to happen down the road. Um, mm -hmm. And we hit times in the economy that that's just inevitably going to happen. Um, but during those high stressor moments, a lot of people forget that you don't just need the first offer that comes to you, that if you're not going to be happy in that role, you can end up self-sabotaging as well, because then when you go to the next role and go to apply for the next thing, and you are, again, like you have been mentioning throughout this whole thing, people talk. Right. They do. <laughs> right. So you're going to know you can go and you might inherently not even realize that someone you're looking at, they know someone else in a different program and you bring up someone's name and they could tell you all about that person and how they performed. When in reality, that not, might not be how they are as an employee. Mm -hmm. They could have just picked the wrong group to work in because they were shy or nervous to just say, no, this isn't what I'm looking for. So I think that's really important to remember, listen to your inner voice, listen that, like you said, if you're having those warning signals of, I don't think this is a fit, but also asking those right questions to individuals and making sure for yourself, it is where your priorities lies. It is where your strengths are. Do you have the resources to if it isn't a strength, right? We all need to continuously grow and improve. So don't just pick a job either. I'm not saying pick a job only on your strengths um, because we all do need to grow. But are the resources put in place and do you have access to them to learn the skill sets that you need to learn and what that might look for? What is a piece of advice you could give an individual about thinking outside the box to approaching? looking for that right job or looking for a new job? You know, I think something else that people do a lot, <laughs> which is being terrified of, of interviewing a lot of the time, they also may not apply to a position. Um, studies have shown that women are particularly guilty of this. If you don't hit every single checkbox or bullet on a job description, you won't apply. Um, I would suggest not doing that. Make sure that it's a fit. I mean, if you are a carpenter, please don't apply for the PR job. Like you, There has to be something there that makes sense. Um, work under the communications umbrella somehow at least. Um, but you don't necessarily need to be expert at every bullet on the list. If you hit 80, 85% of those things, give it a shot. Have a conversation. The worst they can do is say no or not get back to you on your application. That's a very normal thing to happen. But I think taking that chance is something people tend to shy away from. But there's no growth opportunity there if you don't take that chance. If you don't have that conversation, if you don't reach out and give it a shot, if it looks interesting to you and you think that you have the core skills to be successful, try it. Why not? They might have an incredible internal professional development program you would never know about if you didn't apply to the job. They may be open to someone with less direct experience, but you have to try. And it's and it goes back to what you were saying earlier, too, is it's having the conversation. Do not sell yourself either as the candidate that fits every um, check on that checklist 
And then they go in and think you've had 20 years of experience in PR when you've only had five. Right. Um, be transparent and say, you know, have the conversations of I'm willing to learn this. This isn't my strength, but I'm willing to do this. That also, I think, goes a very long way in seeing what a candidate is willing to do, how they're going to perform, how transparent they're also going to be. Um, because I think that's important, too, is sometimes there's that level of feeling like you have to over deliver and commit and stand tall on the fact that you know how to do all these things. And then expectations get made before you're even hired that you're going to be able to do all these things because you never said, hey, these aren't the things I'm necessarily good at or I haven't touched this. But had that conversation and be like, but this is what I could also bring to the table that isn't on that list. Right. I, I, I've had conversations with candidates that are like, I've done all these things, but I haven't done this. And that's an area where I'm really looking to grow and 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 get more opportunity to expand my skill set. That's exactly what I'm going to tell the hiring manager. I'm going to keep it transparent. I'm going to say, this person is great and worth the conversation. They can do all these things. This is the area for growth. And I'll indicate that. And that's not necessarily a red flag or a risk factor. You know, if, if that particular thing just so happens to be the area where the team really needs immediate help right now, then maybe that's not the, the right moment, but it could be. So you have to be transparent, at least with the recruiter you're talking to, so that they can make a case for you that's honest and find the role that makes the most sense for you. Like, I want to figure out who you are and what you're good at so that I can put you forward for the right opportunity. I want you to be successful at the end of the day. So you have to be honest. And like you said, Olivia, don't, please don't oversell. Um, be truthful about your capabilities and be honest about where you want to grow. I don't think it's a... a a moment to say, I lack in these areas or I'm weak in these areas. Those are growth opportunities. And that's a good way to frame it in a conversation with an interviewer too. I think that's important to remember is how you frame the conversation. And something you brought up that I 100% agree upon is that could be what someone's looking for. You know, we sometimes forget that we bring a unique perspective sometimes to a situation when we don't know or have the experience doing something a certain way. That's also mm -hmm. why a lot of times people are looking for that individual that might not check every single box or have been doing that same exact role for 20 years previously because they want that different perspective. They want the insight. They want someone, and I'm not saying everyone does, so this is just you know, one thing I have experienced is walking in fresh, not knowing an organization or not knowing a certain job and looking at it as this is how it has to be done because it's been done this way. But going in green and saying, why is it done this way? Mm -hmm. um, this is what I'm seeing. Not knowing the process. Um, maybe we could change this. It also brings a whole new dynamic to your team to a role, and it can be beneficial for the, the whole organization. And I think sometimes we all forget that, that there is power sometimes and in going into certain aspects of a role brain. And that is sometimes what an organization is looking for. You have to inject that the fresh ideas, the ideation, and it doesn't always come from what's been done. And, and the best feedback doesn't come to the employer from the exit interview. It's the feedback we get in the beginning from someone brand new, from someone who has gone through all these different milestones with an organization. You have to keep checking in with your people. <laughs> you have to figure out what's going on in their heads, what they need, why they stay, why they go. <laughs> but check in throughout and, and not just at that last moment when they're already out the door. There probably was a moment where something could have been done to preserve that that relationship that we missed, you know, and, and no, no, no workplace is perfect. But I think if you, you, you want to strive for just doing better for your, for your people so that those people can do better work and it, it's cyclical, it goes around. Christina, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? The easiest way is definitely LinkedIn. I'm Christina Stokes on LinkedIn. Um, you will see me on there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm publicly available. Uh, to anyone on the platform at all. That is the best place to reach me. 
Thank you, Christina, for all of your insight today. Thank you so much. It was great being here. A few of our key takeaways from today's conversation is always be networking. The power of networking, not just in short term, but in long term, can be so impactful to your trajectory, to conversations you're having, whether it's to get a new job or to fill a role or to learn about different aspects. Network, 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 as well as just because you leave a job doesn't mean you should cut all ties. Christina brought this up throughout our whole conversation today of the idea that you never know where a, a relationship can go. So understand that those little touch base, even if you're struggling on identifying how to keep in contact with someone from an organization, do the little things. Set reminders as well, like Christina said, for birthdays, or if you're seeing someone get a new role or get a job promotion, say congratulations. Don't be fearful of the conversation that can be had because nine times out of 10, it is all positive things as well as everyone is out of time. So don't waste people's time. That is one of my favorite things Christina said today because it is so true. None of us are trying to fill our day with tasks. We're all out, out of time. But how we utilize that time can be just as impactful as well as if you go into something knowing that, hey, I'm out of time, Christina's out of time, how can we best utilize this time? You end up being a lot more effective with that time and having meaningful conversations as well as ask different questions to different people. Christina brought this up, and I think it's so important. She had said how, you know, during a process of getting hired as well as onboarding, you're talking to different people, and especially during that hiring process. Make sure you don't ask the same question to the same people or not a question at all. It's asking the different questions will allow you to get ideas of different aspects of the role, of a team. People are going to have different answers. And that is good. And that gives you insight to even make sure that is really a space where you can thrive and grow and really perform at the best of, at the best of your ability, but also become the best employee for the company that is hiring you. And you don't want to leave six months after coming in. This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Christina Stokes. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.